in improving the health of the community and improving and making a difference. And I really commend you for that, for coming out this evening. And thanks, Divya, for uh, inviting me to come and talk to you guys. So um, I'm not sure you know what you guys' um, background is in terms of uh, what you're working on with the organization and how you are interested in hunger and what these terms really mean. You might have heard the terms hunger, malnutrition, undernutrition, and really feel passionate about that. But if you look at some definitions, hunger, what we look at as a definition is a feeling that we would get when we have we don't have food. Uh, but the actual um, definition by the FAO at the United Nations is if you take less than 1,800 kilocalories per day, then that classifies you as being hungry. Now, some of you may do that anyway just to diet or if you're trying to lose weight, but a routine, typical uh, person, under that kilocalories that you're taking, you're considered to be hungry. Now, under nutrition, you may be eating the right things, but you don't have the proper nutrients that you need to grow. And that becomes extremely crucial for kids as they're growing up in the first few years of life. Another term that you might have come across is malnutrition. And malnutrition can be either overnutrition or undernutrition. So if you're getting obese, and one of our initiatives at the organization is actually the other extreme is childhood obesity. Um, that would also classify under malnutrition. How many of you guys actually know what a global hunger index is? Okay. Well, global hunger index is a number that's given to various countries throughout the world, and that tells you, you know, how your population is doing in terms of hunger. So, data is used from the FAO, from WHO, United Nations, the local data, and they come up with one number for each country. And that gives you the ranking of how bad your hunger problem is in the country. And they have data for about 122 countries and a number that's given to those countries. So the indicators that are used, how do you come up with that number? There are three parts to that number. One is the proportion of people who are undernourished. The prevalence of underweight kids that are younger than five years of age and the death rate or mortality rate of children younger than age five. So when you take these three fragments and you put them together into one composite number, that becomes the global hunger index for that country. So the latest number for 2011, the GHI or the global hunger index, um, the, the, the way it's categorized, so zero being the best and 100 being the worst, and the subdivisions are if you are less than 5 in the country, that's low hunger. 5 to 10, about moderate. 10 to 20, serious. 20 to 29, alarming. And greater than 30, extremely alarming. Now, when they started looking at the Global Hunger Index about 20 years ago, from 1990 to 2011, the overall composite global hunger index for the world was at 19.7 in 1990, and now it's down to 14.6. So there is improvement that's been done, but still a lot of work needs to be done. Um, and the reduction that really happened, the, the majority of that happened for kids who were under five, and they were not getting proper nutrition and were being underweight. So that's where all the efforts have been done. And of the 122 countries, 19 of them, which were in the bottom two category, which was the alarming and the extremely alarming, they have moved out of those categories. So that's a good sign. So all of these efforts that you're doing at the grassroots level, at the college level, at, with all your friends, really is making a difference, even though it is a slower difference. So if you look at the trends over the last 15, 20 years, um, the reductions that have happened in the GHI, in the sub-Saharan Africa was the least amount, it was 18%. Um, and the greatest reduction was 47%, that was in Europe. And if you look at South Asia, which is 25%, 39% in the Near East, 44% in the Southeast Asian region.
So what is South Asia? I'm sure you guys come across this term a lot. We're South Asian, that's a term in vogue nowadays. It really refers to the Indian subcontinent. And what it is, it comprises of these seven categories, uh, seven countries. Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. So the trends in South Asian countries are as follows. So Sri Lanka was in the alarming region, and now it's moved to the serious region. So it has definitely made, an, uh, made a good move. And Bangladesh and India, which were in the extremely alarming area, have gone up to the alarming area. And if you look at this, um, India, it's supposed to be the, the leading economy, growing economy, going fast. It's home to 42% of the world's underweight children. And while you compare that to the neighbor of Pakistan, only 5% of those kids are, under, are uh, underweight. The rankings that are available for 2010, um, they go from 39, Sri Lanka being the best, Pakistan at number 52, Nepal at 56, India 67, and Bangladesh at 68. So these are out of the 122 countries that were ranked. If you look at that, that's pretty not so good. Um, South Asians, we have this myth that we are highly affluent. We are a model minority. And we are a developing country with a fast growing economy. However, that may not be the case if you look at the Global Hunger Index. Um, we had touched a little bit about the health disparities. Um, disparities means in, in health is that there are certain diseases that are more prevalent in the South Asians and that cause impact to their health. So their health becomes actually poorer compared to the other population. So some of the factors that we know are well documented. There's a big amount of stigma and mental illness. Heart disease is much more common in the Asian Indian population. And it actually presents about 10 years earlier. So if you were to compare yourself, uh, I'm sorry, of the South Asians that are sitting in the audience, if you were to compare yourself to the, the white population, you were more at risk of developing heart disease at age 30, whereas another person might be at 40, or if you were at 40, the other one might be at 50. Dental disease is highly prevalent, but the preventive knowledge is minimal, and really, um, I, I was happy to hear that uh, Divya is going to be looking to go to the dental field because that's where it is needed. We don't believe in, in dental prevention. So looking at all of these things, um, I was involved or instrumental in um, developing a grassroots organization called the SKN Foundation. Um, they had mentioned that I was also instrumental in developing the South Asian Total Health Initiative at UMDNJ. Uh, but looking at what I needed to do at the grassroots level, uh, going out into the community and raising awareness, we developed the SCAN Foundation. What we look at, or what we focus on, three parts of health. So physical health, spiritual health, and cultural health. And we have different projects that we're running that each one focuses on different aspects. Um, health education is key. So no matter what field you go into uh, that's health related, you need to go out there and raise awareness in the community. And we try to do that by organizing health fairs, by organizing seminars, sessions throughout the community. Um, so those are some pictures from some of our health fairs. We've also um, created or translated the New Jersey Driver's Manual into Hindi. For the new immigrants that come in, the first thing that you need to know how to do in New Jersey is to drive, and a lot of them, since they don't speak English, this tends to help them to uh, at least get on the road. Next, please. Our obesity prevention initiative called Move It to Lose It, um, so it's actually the extreme opposite of hunger, and that's focused on the use of dance um, as a form of physical activity, and sort of teaching kids how you can use that to um, avoid or prevent childhood obesity from happening. So Bhangra, Hip Hop, Zumba are the three types of dance that we use. And um, this year we're going to be starting another project, hopefully at one of the local schools, which would be a uh, maybe three to six month pilot project where the kids would be enrolled and learn about nutrition. They would have a nutrition class and they would have a dance class. And we would see how 
it impacts their health and how it impacts their obesity. Thanks, please. We do health education through culture. It's very hard to get the community to come in and sit and listen to a dry lecture about your health. So why not take the opportunity where there already are maybe participating in some sort of cultural event and then interject with your health message, kind of like what I'm doing now. So we take the opportunity to, to raise awareness about your health. So here we have, we've uh, arranged concerts uh, called Sangeet Sandhya and Colors. It's a dance performance. Um, the dance performance usually has a theme that has some sort of uh, cancer-related theme and all the, the acts are based around cancer. And Sangeet Sandhya is a classical music concert and many of you may not know that classical music or music therapy is a very useful tool for chronic disease management. So that's a thing we're trying to bring to the forefront so people who have high blood pressure, who have cancer, who have asthma can actually use classical music to improve their, uh, their disease. We also run a uh, Sunday school program for kids where we teach them about, besides their, uh, their culture and their scriptures, we teach them yoga. So these kids are learning about how to focus on, on their health, how to learn about uh, their heritage. We um, are working to develop some scholarships. We've set up a scholarship at the School of Public Health any master's level student who focuses their research on our South Asian community is eligible to apply at the master's level. Um, so that's been in existence for two years. We've set up a scholarship at the local Franklin High School for dance. Um, so any graduating senior who is focusing their energy on improving the health of the community. So those are some of the uh, scholarships we do. We do um, Christmas grant programs through early intervention. Uh, that's the disability related uh, consortium that's in central New Jersey. We do work at St. Clair's Homes, which is a halfway house for disabled kids who don't have a home. So we do uh, grant programs at Christmas time for them. Uh, another project we're working on is something called SARI, which is the South Asian Health Research Institute. It's an online uh, web portal that we're currently developing, which is focused on resources that are available for the consumers, meaning ourselves, or providers, meaning uh, people who deal with the South Asian community. So it's not just about us learning about our health, but it's also about the healthcare providers who are providing care and don't know about our, cu our cultural issues. So they may not be aware that if a 35-year-old Indian male presents with some sort of chest discomfort that actually could be a heart, heart attack that's happening. So our um, goal is to educate on both ends. So what should you do? Um, and I think I started that off. Get involved and make a difference. Um, and I really commend you guys for, for being here and listening to this. Thank you.